Hi, a very good evening all of you. Today's live session will focus on few select topics, including image-based questions and one case-based question from orthodontics. I hope you guys are all ready. So let's start with our session now. And please confirm the audio and video streaming. And also, if you want me to raise my voice, do let me know. I can do it accordingly. OK? Right. So once again, a very good evening. I really hope your day so far has been wonderful. And let's make it even more amazing with this quick revision class on orthodontics. So let's start now. Thank you, Rebut Sina. OK, so uh, first and foremost, uh, let me start with this particular image. By the way, it's not an image-based question. It's definitely not an image-based question. So uh, I actually tried taking pictures of moon using my DSLR. So I spent a couple of hours. I tried different range of settings. And the best shot which I could achieve is this. So what you're seeing now is a picture of a moon. Please give me your feedback. So how is it? I, I really want your feedback on this. Because photography is one of my several passions. And I'm really uh, looking forward to pursue my uh, passion. So your feedback would really give me a lot of hope and excitement without any doubt. So I spent a couple of hours. Uh, this was a few days ago uh, when it was full moon. I spent a couple of hours during night using my DSLR. And as I said, with a varied range of settings, this is the best shot which I achieved. So how is it? Please uh, be frank while giving your uh, feedback. Uh, any kind of feedback is always welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's moon, Monica. So uh, isn't that appearing like a moon? Does it appear like Earth or some other planet? Come on, Monica. Beautifully captured. OK, the best black and white pick. Beautiful. <laughs> OK, so I, I know you're telling all of this. <laughs> OK. OK, I, I know you're telling, you're giving me this kind of positive feedback only because you love me. That's, uh, I hope that's true. So come on, be frank. I know it appears very bad, right? <laughs> I couldn't even capture moon properly and you're asking about stars, Thara. Come on. I should have. Uh, see, you can have expectation, but not to that extent where I, uh, I'll capture all the stars uh, just in my first attempt. No. By the way, I was just kidding. Uh, this was the initial pick which I could secure uh, using different combination of settings. And this is the final image which I captured using my long range DSLR. So I obtained a zoom lens, I bought a zoom lens and this is the best shot I could get of moon for the first time ever. I've been trying to take pictures of moon and every time I take a picture of moon, it's as if like a bulb in a black background. That used to be my best shot. Believe me when I say this. And that's what I've shown you initially also and you all said out of courtesy, you're, you're very diplomatic. You said it was good. <laughs> okay, this is the best shot which I, I, this I got uh, using that uh, DSLR and uh, three things which I have taken care of. And if anyone of you are interested, zoom lens, 250-300mm minimum, and along with zoom lens, the following three settings are very important. Shutter speed, ISO settings, and aperture size. If you can adjust these three, right, at one particular combination, you will get the best picture depending upon what you wish to take or what you wish to capture. So moon is very bright. So I had to uh, increase the shutter speed. And since it was all dark, I had to increase the diameter of the aperture. And regarding ISO, since it's night, ISO sensitivity has to be increased by many fold, 32,000, 64,000. So a combination of these three settings. So if anyone of you are interested, in fact, this dental photography will help you enormously in taking various clinical pictures as well. Case presentation, uh, conveying information to your patients is also very important. So I'm sure these basics will help you elsewhere as well. So shutter speed, aperture size, and ISO. So take care of these three things. 
I'm confident along with zoom lens, along with the proper DSLR, you can capture any planet for that matter, depending upon the zoom range you possess. If you observe this picture, I hope you, you love this picture. So if you observe this picture, the bottom of the moon, you can see almost the below one third. We're talking about thirds because we're always talking about cervical, middle and lower one third, or closer one third. So at the bottom one third, you can see a white spot and you can see radiating lines. Have you observed that? So when I took these pictures, when I returned home and when I was observing these images, that was really fascinating. We can see so many islands, so they're all craters, I assumed. And one thing which was very conspicuous is the bottom white spot. And then you can see streaks of white lines. I hope it's visible even in live session. So what do you think it is? So that's something which I would like to share along with this picture. And then we'll move on to our orthodontics with gradient class. You might be wondering what this guy is doing talking about moon. So this is just out of curiosity and interest, right? Yes. So, uh, okay, I, I'm glad, I'm glad you love this picture. So it is a crater, Tycho crater. It's, uh, I found this information in NASA website and they'll clearly mention that this is very prominent because it has formed very recently. You know, it's because of the impact of some asteroid that uh, because of that force of impact, there were these streaks of line that's very surprising. So Tycho Crater, it's named as Tycho Crater, T-Y-C-H-O. It's one of the most prominent craters on the moon. It appears as a bright spot in southern highlands with a rays of bright material that stretch across much of the near side. Near side. And Tycho's prominence is not due to its size, but because it is relatively young. It is formed recently enough that its beautiful rays that is the material ejected during the impact event are still visible as bright streaks, right? So this is some information which I got from NASA website. It's Tycho Crater, the one which you can see clearly the bottom, as if it's like an orange, isn't it? So a wonderful picture. And if you're really passionate about photography, try exploring, uh, it's a whole different world altogether, right? <laughs> Yes, it's of course pretty and alone. Yeah, it was the maximum zoom click that I could achieve, the maximum zoom. And we can still go with higher higher ranges, but this is the best shot which I could achieve using my lens. I, had a, I have a 250 to 300 mm range zoom lens, so this is what I could achieve. Yeah, I'm just reviewing your comments because at the end of the session, I'm missing all the initial comments. So I'm just uh, reviewing your comments now itself. I'll, I'll get back to you guys as that. <laughs> okay, Lovino. Yes, there and there, you can just get back through me. Yeah. yeah. We can't stray. Uh, come on, Vaishnavi. There has to be a limit to something, right? Uh, for anything, we have a limit. Uh, it seems you're crossing a limit. It seems as if you are dwelling in subject too immensely that no matter what I show you, you're only talking about the subject, which is impressive, but it's too much, a bit too much. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding, right? Lavina, trying to attract your messages. Anyways, you can feel free to share. Now, let's start with our quick revision class from orthodontics after going through the beautiful picture of moon, cool moon, strawberry moon, or whatever it is. So first question, which of the following is relating to passive fixed orthodontic appliances. So passive fixed orthodontic appliances, option A, generate tooth movement. Option B, maintain the attained position of teeth. Option C, capable of only simple tooth movements like tipping. Option D, generate light continuous forces over a period of time. So among them, which one do you think fits to the explanation or the meaning of passive fixed orthodontic appliances? So in the meantime, let me review some information. So we have active fixed and passive fixed appliances. Active fixed appliances are attached or fixed onto tooth surface. And obviously they're active because they are capable of generating forces which bring about various tooth movements. Hence they're called as active. There is passive fixed appliances. These do not generate forces and are responsible for maintaining 
the attained position of teeth. The best example, as you all are aware of fixed retainers or fixed space maintainers, right? So, so among the given options, I see most of you choosing combination of B and B. Yes, option B is a right answer. So passive fixed appliances do not generate forces and are responsible for maintaining the attained position of teeth. Example, fixed retainers, fixed space maintainers, etc. Okay, okay, Lord, when I'm spelling mistakes, it's very much acceptable and I can understand. Right? Now, I hope it's clear. Option B is right answer. Good. Even if you're wrong, you have nothing to worry about. Update the existing information in your mind and then proceed accordingly. Okay? Now, let's move on to our second question, an image-based question. So no options, just the question and in the form of an illustration or image. So identify the appliance or identify what's being presented here. Appears like a stainless steel wire passing on along the cervical portion of the tooth, extending into the undercuts. So identify this component of an appliance, right? I think that's more appropriate. Identify the component of appliance. So this is something which you definitely learn as a basic in your third year orthodontics uh, clinicals. So we have various removable appliances and the components of removable appliances obviously are very important. And this component is the retentive part of a removable appliance, isn't it? So we're talking about very good C-clasp or circumferential clasp, as you can see, circumferentially adhering to the tooth. So circumferential class of C-class or three-quarters class, which is made up of 0.9 mm diameter stainless steel wire. The class uses one proximal undercut and the buccal cervical undercut. The design of class is such that the parallel portion of the wire is embedded in acrylic, which is not evident in this illustration. And from the parallel aspect, the wire is bent in undercut interdentally between the second premolar and first molar. Why passes buccal gingivally below the undercut towards the distal buccal interdental undercut of first molar where it ends? The C class can be modified. We have a modification to engage the mesobuccal undercut, the reverse of what we are seeing now. The circumferential class obviously has a simple design, easy to fabricate, resists deformation, and adjustments are comparatively easier with the class, right? So, this is some additional information related to circumferential class. Now, let's move on to the next question. I'm glad all of you answered it as yes. It's a component of any removable appliance, always appliance, anything, you name it. So it's a component of removable appliance and it forms a retentive component of removable appliance without any doubt. Good. Now let's move on to our next question. Pick the passive component of fixed orthodontic appliances among the following, because in any orthodontic appliance, fixed, we have active and passive components. So among them, which one do you think is a passive component? So in the meantime, let me review some components evident in fixed orthodontic appliances. So we have various active components and passive components. So active components are those which obviously are capable of generating forces, essential for moving tooth, whereas passive components, these are the components of fixed appliance which are not capable of generating tooth moving forces but help in providing attachment for other auxiliaries to the tooth or retaining other active components of the appliances. Various passive components include bands, brackets, buckle tubes, lingual attachments, lock pins, ligature wires and various active components include, I think I've given you the answer, separators, arch wires, elastics, elastomerics, springs, magnets, including magnets, they fall under active components, right? So among the given options, very good. Ligature wires, option D is the right answer. Fantastic. Now let's move on to our next question, an image-based question. So identify the following component of an appliance. So which component do you think it is? Obviously, uh, it seems to be a component of removable appliance and it seems to be providing retention in its own way 
So identify this acclaim. So you can see a U-shaped arch on the buccal side, and then you can see it's extending even palatally as well. So what do you think it is? Obviously, I've given you the answer in the form of a hint. Yes, it's a U clasp. It's a U clasp. So what's the other name for U clasp? Uh, it's not Adam's class. Uh, it's not Adam's class at all. Uh, if you say this is Adam's class, it means during your undergraduation, you asked your friends to do Adam's class for you without any doubt. Okay, I'm just kidding. So this particular class was introduced by Jackson in 1906. So I've given you the hint again. So it's also known as U clasp, molar clasp or full clasp. Exactly. Here, the wire is closely adapted to the buccal cervical undercut, and both the mesial and distal undercuts in the wire cross interdentally on both sides of first molar to end in an acrylic plate, as evident in the illustration top right. The advantages are similar to circumferential clasp, except for adjustments, which are difficult. It cannot be used in partially erected tooth, and modifications are not possible. Some related points. So, as you said, it is Jackson's clasp. U class, full class, molar class, right? Wonderful. So sometimes common sense helps us in answering questions. You can see U shape, so U class. Good. Now let's move on to our next question. So which or the first true lingual appliance marking the beginning of lingual orthodontics was developed by? Previously, I used to skip scientist names. But last year, in, there was a matching question, I reckon. So I started incorporating scientist names in uh, at least one of the sessions. So that, with the hope that it will help you in your upcoming entrance. So first, true lingual appliance marking the beginning of lingual orthodontics was developed by Fujita, like Sujita, Craven Kurtz, Onko, Jim Wildman. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? I'm really surprised that almost all of you are choosing one option, which is obviously the right answer. So Craven Kurtz, option B, uh, an assistant professor at UCLA School of Dentistry developed the first true lingual appliance consisting of plastic leaf fissure brackets bonded to lingual aspect of an lingual aspect of posterior teeth or posterior dentition. The plastic brackets were used for inherent ease of recontouring and reshaping them to avoid direct contact with opposing teeth, right? So Kraven curves is right answer, option B. Well done. Now let's move on to our next question. Again, an image-based question. So identify the uplands. Let's see how many of you are going to answer this right. So you can see top and bottom, the same uh, component of an appliance. So identify this component of an appliance. So what do you think it is? <laughs> okay, if you say Adam's class, it means, as I said prior, during your undergraduation, I'm very sure you got your friends uh, work for you. Uh, prepare or uh, fabricate Adam's class for your on your behalf. <laughs> okay, you can clearly see the hooks, the so-called hooks at the undercut areas. They're circular, almost circular, right? Yeah, that's a hint you have. So this clasp was designed by William Clark. By the way, don't call it as Clark uh, appliance or something, right? The uh, name of the scientist. Designed by William Clark. It's also called as circular arrowhead clasp. It's made of 0.7 mm or 21 gauze uh, or 21 gauze hard stainless steel wire. So what is this class we're talking about? Oh, really? What we did for you, Anushri? I'm glad you both are uh, batchmates. Okay, so you should, uh, uh, Anushri, if you're not able to answer this question now, so you know whom you should blame. So the entire blame goes to so it's up to you to decide. Good, Delta clasp. Yes, Delta clasp. So it was designed by William Clark, also called as circular arrowhead clasp, made of 0.7 mm or 21 gauge hot stainless steel wire. Design advantages and disadvantages, we'll skip that part. 
Okay, now let's move on to our next question. Assertion and reason. Let's see how many of you are going to fall in suit. Assertion, the first premolar should not be extracted until all premolars, permanent incisors and canines have erupted sufficiently for brackets to be placed. Reason, mesial migration is greatly increased by their prior extraction. So, do you think both statements are true or false? Also, do you think reason justifies assertion? So, accordingly, you have the following options. So, do choose the more appropriate option. So, timing of extraction obviously is very important. The premolars. <laughs> okay, Anka. Okay. Right. So, premolars are the ones which are to be sacrificed very often. So, which one do you think is a more appropriate answer? Okay, come on, Anushu. You can't blame a person and again uh, say they are good again uh, in the same context. If you want to blame them, just blame them. Don't worry. I'll take care. Okay, okay, I'm just kidding. So, which one do you think is more appropriate answer? So, in the meantime, let's review some literature. The timing of extraction. The first premolar should not be extracted until all premolars, permanent incisors and canines, that is anterior teeth, have erupted sufficiently for brackets to be placed on them as mesial migration is greatly increased by extraction because of space availability. The only exception to this rule is when second premolars cannot erupt because they are impacted. The four, first premolar should not be extracted more than three weeks before starting active treatment to avoid mesial migration of posterior teeth and therefore leaving insufficient space for retraction. Okay, so as you all have chosen, option A is the right answer. So first premolar should not be extracted until all premolars formed in sizes and canines are if it's sufficient to bracket to be placed because mesial migration is greatly increased by their prior extraction. Wonderful. Now, let's move on to our next question, image-based question. So identify this component of an appliance. So what do you think it is? You can see various designs. You can see a loop. You can see the wire turning around the canine. So also you can see Adam's class. So as a component of this entire setup. So what do you think this component is? Chetna. Chetna says uh, the answer for the previous question. Fifth question is Fujita. Is it Chetna? I mean, if you have any reference, please let me know. I'll definitely go through it. And if key correction is needed, I'll update the very same in the description part of the video. Based on our textbook reference, uh, Gurkirat Singh, it is uh, good. But anyways, if you have a reference, please get back. I'll definitely update the key accordingly. And by the way, appreciate your enthusiasm. Okay, so this buckle retractor, so obviously the entire set of this present buckle is, so buckle retractor is favored by some particularly where the sulcus is shallow, as in case of lower arch. It is also called as helical loop canine retractor or reverse loop canine retractor and is made of 0.7 mm or 21 gauge stainless steel wire. Exactly, so reverse loop canine retractor or helical loop canine retractor. Very good. Just keep this momentum going. Now let's move on to our penultimate question. So squeeze filling effect on tooth movement is explained by which of the following given below theories of orthodontic tooth movement. Pressure tension theory, fluid dynamic theory, bioelectric theory, <coughs> I'm sorry, bone bending theory. Uh, I'm really sorry. Yeah. So, squeeze film effect on tooth movement is explained by which of the following orthodontic tooth movement theories. So, you might have heard of these theories a number of times. So, we have pressure tension theory, various theories for orthodontic tooth movement. Pressure tension theory, blood flow theory, piezoelectric theory, and so on. So, Bayan, who scientist by name, Bayan has been credited for proposing the fluid dynamic or blood flow theory according to which because of the forces uh, the fluid within the PDL gets squeezed so uh, apically and cervically then uh, creates this squeeze filling effect which is responsible for tooth movement. Let's review some literature. Bayan has been credited for proposing the fluid dynamic of blood flow theory. According to this theory, tooth movement occurs as a result of alterations in fluid dynamics within the periodontal ligament 
A force of greater magnitude and duration causes the interstitial fluid in the PDL to get squeezed out and move towards the apex of the apical part and cervical portions. This results in slowing down of tooth movement and is called as squeeze filling effect. Right? So fluid dynamic or blood flow theory. I hope the answer is quite obvious. So option B is right answer. I think some of you have chosen option B. Yeah. So fluid dynamic theory or blood flow theory. If you're wrong, you have nothing to worry about. But if you're right, just keep this momentum going. Okay. Now let's move on to our, yes, fluid dynamic theory. Let's move on to our final question, image-based question. I'm sure you're going to answer it the moment you look into this image. But even if the question is familiar, always go through all the options at least twice, including the question. So what do you think this appliance is or identify this appliance? So it was designed by a person. If I reveal the name of the person, obviously you're going to identify this appliance without any doubt. So it is a strong spring which is made of 1.25 mm stainless steel wire, a heavy stainless steel wire, unlike other components which we have seen previously. This is indicated in expanding a constricted maxillary arch, as you can see in this illustration. And also it helps in correcting cross bites and conditions requiring differential expansion. So identify this appliance, which was introduced by Walter Coffin, Coffin Spring as all of you have rightly mentioned. Wonderful, right? So the challenge lies in answering these easy questions comparatively, because if the question is easy, most of us will answer it right. And if one of you answer it wrong, it's like you're losing a golden egg, right? So the real challenge lies in rightly answering the right or easy questions. I hope you got my point. Now, before we conclude, I have the following case-based question. So review literature and we'll discuss the same in the next quick revision class. In the meantime, you can try finding out the answer. And we can discuss in detail about the same in the next quick revision class. So here is the question. An example of a maxillary permanent central incisor in crossbite is shown in the bottom right, as you can see. In order to treat this condition, that is, uh, you can see a crossbite, single tooth crossbite. The dentist should, option A, do nothing until all permanent teeth have erupted. Option B, surgically re reposition the central incisor. Option C, correct the condition immediately with simple appliance. Option D, place a maxillary expander. Just now we've seen coffin spring. So do you think we can go with some uh, device which expands maxilla? So what's your opinion? What would be your treatment option? among the given options. Okay, right, so try answering this question. We'll, uh, we'll uh, present this question in the next week revision class. I'm sure you'll answer this right, without any doubt. Okay. Right, so I hope the session was informative and uh, as Chetna mentioned about fifth question, I mean, if you, if you have any difference supporting your answer, please get back through me. We'll try to update this in the description part of the video as soon as possible after reviewing, okay? And as I said, uh, I hope the session is informative and for any further queries or assistance, you can always get back through mail 24 by seven. And since some of you were requesting for more questions, I try to uh, incorporate additional questions in the form of image-based questions. Well done, everyone, well done. And as I was discussing with our students in study club, each and every one of you is special and unique in your own way. So try to be yourself and focus on what you wish to achieve rather than resorting to comparisons and putting down yourself. That would be an insult to self, right? So be yourself and try to give your best. Just focus on what you have to do. Just focus on the task at hand. Everything will settle down for itself and you have literally nothing to worry about. If you know the fact that this complex machine, the thoughts which are happening in here are in your control 100%. Not the entire machine, I'm talking about the thought processes, right? And also we show the best for tomorrow's INS set. Please sleep early, have adequate sleep. Just relax, don't study till last minute and 
most importantly enjoy the exam right good night take care love you all <laughs> dil mange more mujhko bhi ankur yes yeah, you're welcome guys uh will we get pencil paper in exam or we i am not sure i haven't found any relevant information information bulletin but anyways let's review that information bulletin assume that you're going to get nothing because in information bulletin of neat exam they've clearly mentioned that nothing will be provided so i don't think anything will be provided tomorrow but you guys should let me know like how it's happening and what's being provided but make sure that you're maintaining social distancing using mouth masks carry a hand sanitizer just take care of these three things right you will have nothing nothing to worry about even though we are in this pandemic situation just carry these basic things maintain physical or social distancing be conscious about the same mouth mask mandatory no mouth mask no exam okay and then keep your hand sanitizer with you right so uh, don't worry about this even in worst case scenario if anyone is face uh, having any symptoms or so in uh, neat and dear information bulletin they have clearly mentioned that there will be isolation labs which will be available for you to take up the exam so you have nothing nothing to worry about okay <laughs> you want to use black side of your admit card for rough work i mean if that's acceptable it's up to you and please don't draw diagrams okay don't draw illustrations or cartoons just like we used to do during our childhood like when we are bored of the lecture we used to draw various cartoons right please don't do that i'm really glad you guys are excited for tomorrow's exam which is a very good sign so as i said enjoy the exam which is very important once in a lifetime experience you're not going to give exams repeatedly this is once in a lifetime experience so enjoy the exam which is very very important okay and then tomorrow evening we will have a live discussion you can let me know the keywords or questions and we'll try to analyze how the paper is okay right take care sleep well dream big and go to exam center as early as possible okay no last minute rush yeah how much questions to answer see it is customized answer as many questions as you can if you are confident enough uh because it's a new pattern uh, we were not even sure about the kind of questioning but answer as many questions as possible don't go with this minimum criteria basis i personally hate the same if you're confident try answering as many questions as possible but don't answer based on luck or fluke don't do that if you don't know the answer it's better to leave it out if you can rule out at least two options i would suggest you to take a chance and answer that question okay chalo good night good night guys